So the important thing to remember is there's a small number of children born with, with or uh, who have actually acquired during life a limb deficiency. Um, the vast majority don't have any, any cause. Uh, if you all remember back to your detailed embryology, it's still um, fairly poorly understood. Um, the child will obviously continually change developmentally and that will have to alter what you do uh, and alter what you plan for them. Uh, so you've got to bear in mind you've got to keep the, the door open for the child to, to keep coming back if there's any problems, but yet provide for optimal functioning for their age. Um, and I suppose a, a successful outcome depends on treatment of the whole family. And these, reading some of the uh, some of the literature, um, they're generally quite pleasant patients. These, um, which do well if they are uh, brought up in a healthy family unit. So it's important that the the whole family gets treated at the same time. So in terms of um, uh, limb differences, uh, there are several types. There can be failures of formation, failures of differentiation. Uh, duplication, um, uh, overgrowth or undergrowth, or uh, congenital constriction bands, uh, and I'll deal with a, a couple of these as we as we go along. So, in terms of the epidemiology, the the incidence is estimated at around four to ten thousand births. Um, about sixty percent uh, of uh, limb deficiency is congenital, and uh, around forty percent. Uh, in terms of male to female ratios, um, slightly more predominant in the males, uh, congenital, and in the acquired groups, three to two. And uh, uh, often uh, more on the left side uh, in uh, unilateral upper extremity transverse deficiency, and I'll go into that a bit later on. In terms of embryology, the limbs form between four to seven weeks of uh, gestation. Uh, from a proximal to distal sequence. Uh, the upper limb develops slightly ahead of the lower limb, uh, but simultaneously with organ development um, and is associated with a radial deficiency. So in terms of how the, what the limb morphogenesis is, the thickening of the lateral plate mesoderm signals um, and the overlying ectoderm to thicken and form a, a ridge. And this Apical ectodermal ridge controls proximal uh, to distal limb growth, uh, and that's how it develops in a proximal to distal direction. And most defects um, will occur in this uh, in this period, uh, and it's regarded fourth to the eight weeks of gestation and the most critical time, so in the first trimester, um, and uh, the most sensitive period in terms of. Um, Efficiencies occurs between the fifth and sixth week. And this is just an example here of a young child with an upper limb deficiency. So why is it caused? Well, the, there's congenital and... Uh, so I'm just going to deal during the talk with um, some comparisons between congenital limb deficiency and acquired limb deficiency. And I'll just explain that. But the congenital, vascular and uh, um, genetic factors... Uh, in the congenital group as well as maternal factors. And in the acquired group, um, the reasons for limb loss are really meningococcal burns and trauma, um, and also tumours and vascular malformations. Tumours being quite common in the uh, 12 to 21 age. So a child with a congenital uh, limb deficiency, uh, so if they've been born with it, they won't uh, feel a sense, of no, no sense of loss. And it's something they, they, they won't have to adjust to. It's something they'll have adjusted to from day one. Um, and they use a prosthesis as an aid uh, to function. Uh, and there's, there's quite um, significant family adjustment issues, not only when the child is born to adjust to that, but uh, as they develop, there's things that they, that, uh, milestones that they reach. And you've got to try and help them with a prosthesis to do that. And in terms of their acquired limb loss, um, there's quite a profound sense of loss of limb, and there's a major period of readjustment that you have to counsel and um, help the patients through. And I suppose how well they adjust affects how they'll accept the prosthesis. Some patients, uh, under no circumstances, want, want a prosthesis. It's important to, to counsel them about that. 
there are environmental, environmental and genetic uh, um, etiologies of congenital deficiencies. Environmental etiology, no one really knows uh, what causes it in the vast majority of cases. There might be uh, vascular causes, uh, particularly some kind of thromboembolism, but this is poorly understood uh, at this stage. Um, mechanical um, causes such as amniotic bands or stridus dysplasia, where multiple limbs are involved, um, may be a cause. And uh, in the mother, diabetes and intrauterine infection are two major causes. Um, thalidomide uh, is the only proven drug to definitely cause uh, congenital limb deficiency. Uh, others are suspected, but there's no convincing evidence yet. There are there are pharmaceutical guidelines to guide you in that way. Things you uh, they advise not to take during pregnancy. Um, in terms of genetic uh, causes, there are some chromosomal abnormalities, Turner syndrome. Uh, autos so in single gene abnormalities and autosomal dominant um, uh, gene deficiency may cause a longitudinal tibial deficiency and an autosomal recessive gene uh, which may cause TAR which is thrombocytopenia and an absent radius which I'll go into later. Um, in terms of uh, acquired deficiencies of the limb, so the vast majority are from trauma, especially trains and lawnmowers. So, um, just be careful, Mr. Hall, in the garden. Um, and uh, disease uh, may account for a third, um, and the majority are caused by malignancy. There is a um, Franson or Rahili uh, classification of limb deficiency, which uh, they define as terminal or intercalary transverse or paraxial, complete or incomplete. And there are multiple terms that are used, amelia, which means total absence of the limb, hemimelia, which means partial, partial absence of the limb involved, focomelia, which means absence of the long bones, adactyly, which means absence of the fingers, or achyria, which is absence of a hand, or apodia, which is absence of a foot. But the main classification for congenital limb deficiency is from the ISO, International Organization for Standardization. And, you restrict, and this is restricted purely to a skeletal radiological deficiency. So we get involved with first off. A transverse deficiency will, will mean that there's no skeletal elements at all present. So you name the level of the portion of the limb, such as the upper arm, or, and then state the, the portion where the, where the absence occurs, such as the middle third. In a longitudinal efficiency, the skeletal elements are present axillary or distally. So you name the bones involved and state partial or total absence. So in this example, so you've got a longitudinal deficiency of the tibia, which is total. Uh, part of the tarsus is missing, so partial uh, tarsus partial, and the first ray is also gone, uh, so it's total. Different from um, uh, patients with, with an acquired limb deficiency, where you classify uh, uh, in the long bones, so through the long bones, so in the upper extremity, transradial, which is a uh, below elbow, transhumeral, above elbow, uh, lower extremity, transtibial or transfemoral, which is your knee and above knee amputations. Or through the joint, the, the name of the joint and the disarticulation, so your upper extremity, for example, your wrist or dis in your lower extremity ankle disarticulation. Just deal with a couple of examples um, of congenital upper limb deficiency. So there's transverse radial deficiency or below elbow amputation. And this is a um, terminal transverse radial amputation, which is sporadic with no genetic component. Uh, and there's no other associated symptoms, syndromes, uh, which is very important to bear in mind those two facts um, when screening the family and uh, seeing whether there's any other congenital anomalies. So with th these patients at six months, you give them a passive prosthesis, which will allow them um, a two-handed grasp, which will help their uh, uh, development and fine motor skills in their normal hand, and allow them to, to eventually get crawling and adapting to wearing a prosthesis. And then around 18 months to two years, you fit a new device uh, to act as a simple grasp.
In terms of longitudinal deficiency of the radius or radial aplasia, um, this is a, either a congenitally acquired partial or total absence of the radius, and it has varying degrees of severity, um, from very mild to complete absence of the radius in the thumb. And this is associated with uh, syndromes such as Vactor, which is vertebral anal atresia, cardiac, tracheoesophageal atresia, renal and limb abnormalities, and as well uh, the TAR syndrome, like I've mentioned already. Most have a most of these longitudinal deficiencies of the radius have an associated syndrome that, that you should look for. Uh, and the treatment or options will vary from serial casting or splinting to what's called a centralization of the hand, where you position the hand wrist unit on the end of the ulna epiphysis. In terms of transverse deficiencies, uh, the limb is developed normally to a particular level beyond which no skeletal elements exist, although there might be digital buds. And the cause of this can, can vary um, from vascular disruption, failure of formation, uh, or constriction or amniotic fluid. An example here of vascular disruption, you can see the very tiny toes here. Uh, and this is where there's a constriction, constriction ring and band, and abnormality of the great toe. In terms of longitudinal deficiencies in the lower limb, uh, there are many, which I won't go into all of them today, it's quite a complex area, but proximal focal femoral deficiency, or PFFD, and fibular deficiency, um, the, uh, the more common ones. Um, proximal focal femoral deficiency is profoundly short femur with a bulbous thigh segment lying in external rotation and flexion, um, and the, the knee is flexed with cruciate insufficiency, and the foot is at the level of the opposite knee. Or Most are unilateral, and over, over a, a, around a two thirds are associated with a fibular or other skeletal abnormality. Here's an example here of a proximal focal femoral deficiency. You see that the, the foot's almost at the level of the other. Um, so there are several types, there's type A to D, um, and you can classify these where the defect is, is it between the femoral head and the shaft with uh, spontaneous restoration during growth or is there a persistent discontinuity between the hip joint and the femur. Uh, femoral head may never ossify and you get a dysplastic. In a type D you get complete absence of the femoral head. Many management options which I'm sure um, um, Mr. Harris Including femoral lengthening and uh, uh, surgical procedures to provide hip stability and continuity. Um, other uh, procedures are are um, here in certain circumstances, such as a sign removal of the foot and fusion of the knee joint with prosthesis, nest rotation plastic, or other non-standard prosthesis. Uh, Yeah. Uh, and then in longitudinal deficiency of the fibula, there's there's a shortening and anterior bowing of the tibia. Uh, with absence of the lateral metatarsal rays and the equine valgus foot deformity and cruciate ligament. So you, in terms of your management options for this is either an extension prosthesis, a leg lengthening plus with or without an ankle stabilization uh, or inversion amputation through the ankle. Stable knee. And then this is a, this is a So in terms of um, 
you know, the treatment's obviously quite complicated. There are certain principles you, you should adhere to. Um, what you're trying to get is a, is a healthy body image uh, and try and uh, reinforce your choice is open for a prosthesis, if you can, and optimize a function for the child's age. General considerations are obviously a team approach. This should be managed in a, in a, in a place that uh, uh, deals with this a lot in a, uh, with a multidisciplinary team. Um, allow for a fairly regular follow up or, uh, when the child. Goals and return appointments, they say, uh, every sort of three months uh, to evaluate the prosthetic fit and function and annually to reassess the child's development, especially when they're young. Psychosocial support is um, very key. It's important that the children meet others with similar similar conditions, more so as they get older, to create a better body image. There's often a lot of guilt and associated um, family familial problems if there's a genetic uh, problem. Need counselling, genetic counselling. As the child gets older, give them some control. Um, these uh, general deficiencies are often mixed and needs to be considered in very functional terms, shortening and uh, instability in terms. Version amputation is never really applicable enough. And in terms of the surgical planning, timing is very important. So, uh, age up with the child's development. Very important to consider um, growth plates. Um, and you know, how that plans your operations. Overgrowth is very common, so um, uh, stump overgrowth um, can be a problem. You've got to, when, you, when you bark on surgery, you've got to leave the door open because you, you might need to. Well, it's quite a dry topic. Thank you.